Hey you guys, this is Dr. Anna and this is our second sequence in the early Paleozoic uh, slideshow. Uh, the last segment I finished with the Tipekanu sequence and I just went through this slide showing the generals of the Tipekanu sequence starting with an unconformity. Uh, it followed by a recycled absolutely clean quartz sandstone which we in this case call St. Peter sandstone followed by the, because North America is in the tropics with the limestone, uh, very important at this time, the barrier reef and the pinnacle reefs, and then the peak transgression represented with by, by the shale, and then the regression uh, brought back the, the limestone with lots of lots of evaporates. So let's start it. Uh, the Tipekanu also started with a major transgression, just like the Sauk. And uh, the first product of this transgression was the St. Peter sandstone, as I just mentioned. Uh, this is almost pure quartz, which is extremely important for the glass industry because uh, to make white glass, you need extremely pure quartz sandstone to, um, if it has all, like if you go to Virginia Beach right now and you look at the quartz sandstone there, quartz sand I should say it's full of black minerals which are amphiboles and biotites so that could not be used for white glass it has to be like green or blue glass but for white glass you need to have absolutely clean quartz sandstone uh, this this recycled proterozoic quartz sandstone uh, is overlaid by limestone as the second product of the Tipekanus transgression and this uh, carbonate is mostly biochemical in origin, and it has corals, brachiopods, bryozoans, and there is a lot of dolomite, and the dolomite, the presence of dolomite always, always tells you that the climate is pretty dry. Uh, when when the, the sea level goes up, this carbonate deposit is going into shale as the transgression continues. Uh, which is typically a deep water facious and it shows the time for the peak transgression. The major and very, very important features of the Tipekanu sequence are reef facious and a lot of evaporates. In the, in the middle of the vision, there is a lot of stromatoporoid coral reef. Uh, and these guys were actually primitive layered sponges. It's weird that I did reefs, what I did. During the middle Silurian, uh, the reef and evaporate fascias are even more common. And one of the great examples for this is the Michigan Basin. This is how the stromatoporoid reefs looks like. And this is the so-called pinnacle reef. When you have a pinnacle reef, that just means that you're in a deeper water area. And the coral reefs are actually, and the reefs usually can keep up with the sea level changes. So therefore, you're going to have a low patch of corals, which are able to keep up with the sea level. They have to be in the photic zone, remember? But everything else is deep water fa fascia. So you're going to end up having a patch reef like this, or pinnacle reef. It looks like a low tower. And this next slide just actually shows you the Michigan Basin and how around the Michigan Basin we have all these reef fascias and uh, because of those they usually stick out of the water just a little bit so they make the, the area behind the barrier reef like restricted means that they cannot, that this area doesn't communicate with the rest of the ocean so Behind it, because it was relatively arid, actually the sea water completely evaporated and that formed a whole lot of salt deposit in the Michigan Basin at this time. And right now we are at the Appalachian Mobile Belt. So we just finished the Salk and Tipekanu sequences and now we are talking about the different mobile belts during this time uh, in North America. And as, as we already kind of mentioned that during the Salk time, which is at the very beginning of the Cambrian, and uh, North America and Baltica both was lying on the passive margin of the Iapetus Ocean, which was, which was growing. Remember, Iapetus Ocean is the, is the Proto-Atlantic Ocean, so it's the ocean before the Atlantic. And it was in the tropics, so there was a whole lot of limestone forming right here.
and actually on the other side to Antarctica. All this limestone you, you see everywhere, like Collins College, um, by the Tat County, everywhere on I-81 you see these limestones. During the middle or, or the vision, actually, the Iapetusotian started to uh, become convergent plate boundary. First, the uh, uh, oceanic continent, oceanic, oceanic, an island arc formed. And then later, first an island arc formed, and then later the island arc got closer and closer to the continent, and finally, actually the island arc collided into, into East North America. And that is the beginning of the formation of the Appalachian. And the whole area become an area like today, the Rockies. I don't know which one is better to live. I like mountains and we have mountains, but these were really high mountains, just like the Rockies today. And if you think about as soon as this island arc actually collided into North America, we have had um, a volca volcanically active oceanic mountain uh, region. And right behind we had the so-called Foreland, ba this is the Foreland Basin, Foreland Basin right here. And you can imagine that in this Foreland Basin, the most of the sediment was coming from these volcanoes or the older rocks which were in that area and got pushed up. And um, so it's a typical Foreland Basin. And the, the sediment which formed in this area is the so-called clastic wedge. Uh, there was a lot of um, alluvial fan and, and very unsorted sediment. So that shows you an un, uh, immature sediment that shows you that the mountain was right there. So these formations were very, very close to the um, source area. Actually, the whole uh, foreland basin was filled up with these clastic sediments. We call them clastic wedge. And uh, the origin of the sediment is this highland, which we call the Tacony Highland, because the orogeny, this orogeny, the island arc uh, continent collision is what we call Tacony orogeny. So you should remember this name. And the, the sediment was originated from the Tacony Highland, which is right deep, right here. And now we are at the mineral resources of the early Palazoic. And we have quartz sandstone. Remember the, the St. Peter and even the first quartz sandstone, sandstone is very important for the glass industry. Other than that, we have gravel, lots of lots of limestone. And limestone is very useful for building stone. You can also use it for making concrete. You can put it as lime down on the acidic soil. So it, it has a whole lot of different usage. We also have a lot of evaporates just close to us. We have Saltville with the salt. And remember the name of, the original name of Roanoke is what? Yeah, Big Lake. So that just means that we have had a lot of uh, salt around here too. We also have had a lot of gypsum mine around this area. The other very important thing is the Mississippi Valley type deposit. It's called MVT. MVT. So the Mississippi Valley type deposit, also called MVT, Mississippi Valley type MVT deposits. These were very, very important, and you find them just about everywhere, but there is a lot of it in Tennessee and Missouri, and of course we have it in Virginia, we just don't have much of it. The Mi Mississippi Valley type minerals are very interesting because most of the time the sulfur, the copper, and the iron coming from the deep waters and uh, they actually react with the ocean water and everything and they're producing these really cool uh, mm. uh, ore minerals everywhere. So you will find it just about everywhere uh, in North America. And these are the very typical minerals in it. This is dolomite, uh, this is the fluorite this fallorite, the fluorite is calcium uh, CAF2. The sphalorite is ZNS. So that's the sphalorite. 
the fluorite is right here that's dolomite remember that's calcium magnesium carbonate dolomite it's it's a d here dolomite and then very interestingly actually these minerals contain a lot of fluid inclusions and the fluid this is fluid inclusion they take the rock sample they actually um thin it to 30 to 40 micron and you can put it under a microscope you can enlarge it and actually at the same time the stage of the microscope can be heated or cooled so when you look into the microscope you'll see a fluid inclusion which has actually itty bitty mineral like cubes if it's salt or triangles if it's calcopyrite and then it will have possibly a gas bubble so what you can do is that you can start heat because every every fluid inclusion at the formation is a single phase fluid inclusion and when it cools down it will produce these um, minerals possibly and definitely a gas bubble so when you start heating it there will be a temperature where the gas bubble disappears and then there will be a temperature where actually the minerals will disappear so this is the cool thing that when you look at the fluid inclusions you can get the temperature of a, a lot of different events and cooling it down again will shows you the, the temperature of this certain formation so it's a very very interesting and very cool thing to do this is a, a piece of mineral which I collected actually in Tennessee. Uh, Elmwood, Tennessee is one of the most famous uh, copper lead mine, uh, sulfide mines. It has calcopyrite, it has fluorides, fallorite, galena, so it's, it's pretty amazing. I don't think it's working anymore. I think it shut down. The reason that it did because you know the lead is very toxic so people just don't really care uh, for uh, mining it anymore. But there are a lot of times when actually they have amazing minerals and the minerals themselves are bringing a whole lot of money because there's a lot of collectors and they are uh, dying to get these minerals so it, it they will pay a lot of money for getting these amazing pieces of minerals actually. Uh, the calcite in this Tennessee, Amwood, Tennessee area is amazingly beautiful honey yellow and this based on the fluid inclusion studies actually this this uh honey yellow is coming from oil inclusion so that just tells you that at the formation of this calcite oil was migrating through all these deposits which is really interesting and this is the galena itself and the galena is the ladder but the, what is interesting about this lead that most of the time this will contain silver Astray Silliman, but it also will contain rare earth elements. So I guess one of these days they'll go back and they will mine it anyways because because of all these very important things. So the Galena itself is lead sulfide and it's really simple, it's PBS. And now we are at the life of the early Paleozoic. And actually, like a little bit of uh, summary, at the beginning of the Cambrian, there is a major turning point in the animal evolution uh, with the creation of exoskeletons, exoskeletons, which means the animal is saved from outside by a hard body part. And um, however, life during the early Paleozoic was still restricted to the, to the ocean. Uh, and the vertebrates have not really evolved yet. So the life mostly was invertebrate groups. Uh, the Cambrian was a golden age of the trilobites we're gonna talk about. There is more than 600 different types of trilobites and they were mud borrowing scavengers and they were really flourishing the oceans. By the Ordovician uh, time, actually the, the brachiopods outnumbered the trilobites so they were the most widespread animals. And the Ordovician also marked the appearance of the first cephalopods. And these guys are very mobile and highly developed mollusk. And they've become major predators of the time. This two picture is actually showing you 
the ecological complexity and the changes from Precambrian to the Paleozoic. On the left, you can see the the uh, Adiacaram, which was at the very end of the Cambrian, uh, Precambrian, remember? And you can see that all these guys were suspension feeders, all these guys were suspension feeder at least passive food gatherers, which means they we didn't have any predators. On the other hand, if you look at the the Cambrian, this is how it looked like. So there was a lot of carnivores, suspension feeders, and deposit feeders. But it's more, uh, it's very different from the Precambrian. The first and more important uh, living things were still the stromatolites, which is inherited Archean uh, Proterozoic life. Uh, the stromatolites at the time lived like algae heads, like these. And actually, this is from Australia, and it's a living stromatolite today at Shark Bay, you know, which is Western Australia. And uh, if you look at this one, they found this in Baxley Quarry, which is Cambrian limestone. And right now it's in um, Martinsburg at the museum. So if you ever want to see this big stromatolite head just like this, this is in Martinsville. Martinsville, yes, at the Natural um, Museum of Natural History. The next animal group we have to talk about, if we talk about the, the Cambrian Ordovician, is the trilobites. The trilobites are very, very characteristic index fossils. Remember index fossils? Those are the ones which are changing pretty often, so they are good for one or two million years. Uh, they appeared during the early Cambrian, and they are uh, part of the arthropod group. Arthropod means joint-footed. Uh, which this day represents, uh, to this day, represents the most successful, about 78% of all animal life forms, including crabs, centipeds, spiders, shrimps, and insects. Uh, the trilobites lived in shallow water. Uh, they were swimmers, crawlers, and borrowers for some 350 million years ago. And they uh, actually evolved really, really rapidly. And they made really beautiful, bizarre uh, shapes and forms, even to their standards. Uh, they made some futuristic forms. The trilobites, called trilobites, because they have three parts, the uh, cephalon, which is the head, the thorax, and the Piglidon, and they also trilobites because they have three lobes. So that's a trilobite. You got to know just the word trilobite and what kind of life they had. So it's kind of interesting. The next one is the brachiopods. The brachiopods were very common uh, living things. The next animal group, which is important during this time, is the brachiopod. We also call them lamp shells. They are uh, ancient phylum or filter feeding marine, marine worms. Um, they live inside a pair of shells, but what is interesting, the two shells are different, and when the animal dies, actually the, the muscles hold the shells, the, the, the valves together, so the two valves are always formed together. One is different than the other. Um, they do have the dorsal and the ventral, the upper and the lower, and they are always different, as I just said. But they do have a very strong bilateral symmetry. When I say bilateral, that means that each valve is symmetrical from the middle to this side and this side. Um, brachiopods usually have a... a the dorsal or the lower shell, which is uh, always la larger than the other one. And on the other hand, with the bivalves, the two shells usually are completely equal. And the main difference is that when the bivalve die, their muscle relax. So the two, sh two valves is never formed together or very, very, very rarely. So the brachiopods are very important uh, group of animals at this time. 
The next one is the echinoderms. The echinoderms are, uh, belong to the phylum echinoderm. Uh, they have very typical penta-5 symmetry, which is nowhere else can be found on Earth except in the, in the animal groups, especially the echinoderms.